Well, this evening, our focus passage is going to be Luke chapter 23, verses 33 through 49, as we remember and reflect and respond to the crucifixion and death of Jesus on this Good Friday. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn there. In this passage, we see Christ as the true King, laying aside His crown of glory, submitting to the will of the Father to suffer and die on the cross, in which He's fulfilling God's plan to redeem, restore, and unite all things. And so we see Jesus accomplishing the work that only He, the true King, can do. And, and, and through Christ, on the cross, God is forgiving our sins and granting us eternal life. And as I was preparing for tonight, you have four options because there are four Gospels, and each Gospel has an account of the crucifixion and death of Jesus. But I was drawn to Luke's account because Luke, he, he, really, he really focuses in on the work that God is accomplishing through Christ Jesus in this moment. And he also draws on the responses of those who witnessed it, and he even draws on the cosmic response to Christ's death as well, too. So before we go to the passage, I want to go back to the beginning of Luke, where Luke, in chapter 2, verse 8, he has a detailed account of the birth and the events around the birth of Christ. But one of the events that to me is significant is where the angels come to the shepherds and they announce the arrival of the long-awaited King and Messiah. And in that moment, there's this cosmic response to His birth. And this cosmic response is the glory of heaven piercing the dark sky and a host of angels praising God and rejoicing. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those whom God favors. The heavens rejoice and nature rejoices at the birth of a king. And in that moment, there are some significant things that happen. We see heaven and earth coming together. We see the glory of the Lord in display. And what this does is it gives us a preview for really what God is ultimately doing through Christ. And that is revealing His full glory. So as we think about the storyline of the Bible, it begins in Genesis with the creation and the fall, and then it culminates in Revelation with Christ coming and establishing a new earth and making all things new, where we will live forever in the full fullness of His glory and enjoy Him forever. But before that can happen, Christ must come first as a suffering servant. He must come first laying aside his crown of glory to suffer and die on the cross. So Luke chapter 2 speaks of the glory of the Lord piercing the dark sky at his birth. In, 23, it's a, in chapter 23, it's a different picture. Now the light of day is veiled in darkness at the response of Jesus' death. So let's read together from Luke chapter 23, verses 33 for 49. And when they, Jesus and all who were gathered for his crucifixion, came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who, was, who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, 
for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. It was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sunlight, sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for his spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breast. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Let's pray. Oh, Father, as we come together to remember and reflect on the ultimate expression of love and mercy through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, Father, may you open our hearts and our eyes and our ears to receive your word and to have a deeper understanding for the magnitude of what is accomplished in this moment and that it may shape our lives in a way that causes us to be more forgiving, more joyous about eternal life, and more willing to entrust our lives into your hands. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So for the time that we have left this evening, I want to focus on three things that Jesus, the true King, is accomplishing in his crucifixion and death. The first one is he asked God to forgive those who are executing him. In verse 34, but prior to this moment, if we think about all the events that have led up to this moment, Jesus was betrayed by one of his disciples. He was arrested under the cover of night so that his accusers could avoid trouble. He was falsely accused of crimes. He was convicted wrongfully in crimes without real due process. His followers have deserted him. He's been beaten. He's been mocked. And now finally, he's placed on the cross to suffer the most tortuous and humiliating death imaginable. And so how does he react to this moment as he's being raised onto the cross? He intercedes to the Father on behalf of those executing him. And he asked God the Father to forgive them because they have no idea what they're doing or what is truly happening in this moment. Some Bible commentators have mentioned that it was common for those being crucified because it was such a a horrific and traumatic experience that those who were being executed in this way would cry out in anger for vengeance because of the injustice done to them and the horror that is done to them. And they would cry out cursing um, their, their executioners, who were, or the people who were carrying out their execution. But this is not how Jesus responded at all. He, out of great compassion, compassion and mercy, he prays for his executioners. He prays for God to forgive them. And why did he react with such compassion towards his executioners and the hostile crowd amid such horror and amid such injustice? Well, let me provide four brief observations. First of all, he could do this because he is God the Son. And he is the full expression of compassion and mercy. He is the source of compassion and mercy. So in the middle of being hung on the cross and then having his clothes gambled away by the soldiers as a part of his humiliation, he prays for God to forgive the soldiers and all those who are participating in this event. They were acting in ignorance, and again, they didn't know what was truly happening, but Jesus did. He knew that he was sacrificing himself so that they might be forgiven. Second, he did this because he knows that it was the will of the Father that he must suffer and die. This was God's plan all along, and Jesus knew this. 
As we read in Isaiah 53 a moment ago, it says that it was God's will to crush him and to put him to grief as an offering for the guilt of man. Jesus knew his death was necessary to fulfill God's plan to redeem and restore and unite all things. <clears throat> and he was willing to do it out of love and obedience to the Father, but also out of deep love for us as well, too. Third, he did this because he has the authority to forgive. He has the authority to forgive sins and mediate for us as our great high priest. In Luke chapter 5, we have the account of Jesus healing the paralytic. And in verse, tw- um, and in verse 23... Jesus says that he's healing this man so that we would know that he has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he had the authority to do it. And then last, why he reacted this way to his executioners and those who were mocking him. It's because he was modeling what he taught to his disciples. In Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28, he said this to his disciples, and he's saying this to us. He says, But I say to you who hear, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who abuse you. So I want to acknowledge again that Jesus can do this because he's not like us. He is God the Son. For you and me, forgiveness is quite a bit more difficult and very different because of our struggle in the flesh. It's more difficult for us to receive and it's more difficult for us to to give. We could spend weeks exploring what the Bible has to say about forgiveness, and we really don't have time to tonight. However, I do want to share an excerpt from um, Tim Keller's new book, which is called Forgive, Why Should I and How Can I? And I want to commend it to you as a resource as well. Tim Tim Keller writes this, and he's writing specifically about the event we just were reading about in, in Luke. He says that when Jesus Christ was dying on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. He is saying that what they have done is wrong and it requires forgiveness, and yet he asked the Father to forgive them. So instead of screaming at his executioners, you'll get yours, what does he say? He says, Father, they really don't understand the magnitude of what they are doing. Jesus was pleading forgiveness for those who were killing him. And he goes on to say, If he treats his executioners like that, how can you and I be cold and withdrawn? How can we be caustic and harsh with people? Jesus wouldn't talk like that even to his own torturers. May God give us the grace and patience that we can grow only out of a deep grasp of Christ's dying mercy for us. He goes on then to explain to me what was really helpful to understand is that he, has these, he identifies these dimensions of Christian forgiveness. And what he says is, first, there's the vertical. That is God's forgiveness of us. Second is the inward. And really, it's our ability to grant forgiveness to anyone who wrongs us. And then third, there's this horizontal, and really, it's our offer to reconcile. And they're all interconnected and built with on one another. The vertical drives the internal, and the internal allows for the horizontal. But ultimately, this is the point. It all starts... That our, it all starts with our ability to forgive is because we are forgiven through the death and suffering of Jesus. And so this is what it means to be gospel-centered people and have a gospel-centered culture. And you might hear me or some of the elders talk about that at some moments. And, and really what we're, what we're trying to say is that we want to be known as a people at ZEF, as a church body who is known for loving, for being generous, and being forgiving inspired by the gospel. And so, if we are going to be this loving, generous, forgiving people inspired by the gospel, we have to then ask ourselves a few questions. If I believe, if you and I believe in the gospel, but then hold grudges against others, at the very least it shows that I'm not allowing the gospel to have its full effect on me. Or, It could mean that I don't believe it at all. So he who endured the greatest injustice, suffering, and shame was willing to forgive his enemies, those who put him to death. And how can we not forgive those who offend us? 
And I don't want to minimize your suffering and your pain caused by others because I know that forgiveness is a complex thing. But what I do want to do tonight is point you to the one who experienced the ultimate injustice and suffering and yet was willing to forgive those who mocked him and put him to death. That should inspire us to be forgiving. So that's the first thing. He intercedes to the Father on behalf of his enemies for forgiveness. The second thing he does in verses 39 to 43 is he grants eternal life to the criminal. So in the beginning of the passage, we observe that Jesus is crucified between two criminals, one on his right and one on his left. It's likely that these criminals were violent criminals. Um, It's likely that they were involved in some sort of insurrection against the government. Because it was common for the Romans to use this method of execution as a deterrent for future rebellion. Point is, we really don't know what their crimes were. But from the text, we know that they were guilty of whatever crimes they committed and Jesus was innocent. That much is clear. So, in verse 39, one of the criminals railed to him and said, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the second criminal rebuked him and said, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. It's worth reading that again. (laughs) One criminal responded to Jesus in anger and contempt, much like the rest of the crowd. He mocks Jesus, and he thinks only of himself when he says, save yourself, and by the way, me too. It's one thing for Jesus to be mocked by the crowd. But when Jesus is mocked by a fellow condemned criminal, that's a whole new level of humiliation. The second criminal's response is very different. He defends Jesus by acknowledging Jesus' innocence. And he recognizes that Jesus is the true king. And how can we infer this? Because he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He wouldn't have said that if he didn't think that Jesus was a king. Only kings can have kingdoms. So this criminal understands his guilt. And that he is accountable to God for his sins and that Jesus can save him. So when facing death, one criminal piles on insults. The other repents in faith. The second criminal fears God and appeals to Jesus for mercy. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. This criminal, again, would not be asking Jesus for mercy and deliverance if he did not think Jesus could grant it. And Jesus, in fact, did. He told the criminal, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus is affirming this second criminal's faith in his salvation. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the term paradise is used in Scripture to most most often refer to either the Garden of Eden or heaven. I don't know exactly what Jesus was referring to, but I do know this. Paradise is where Jesus was going, and the criminal would be with him. We know that much to be true. So before we move on to the last point, I want to share with you a few notes of encouragement from this section. First of all, we all have friends that we pray for and plead God to save. If God can save the criminal on the cross in his last moments of life, after a life poorly lived, he can do this for others too. So do not give up on them. Continue to pray for them. Continue to speak gospel truth into them. A second encouragement is that salvation is not just for the distant future. It is to be enjoyed today. I don't know what the reaction was of the criminal who heard those words from Jesus, today you'll be with me in paradise, but I have to imagine it was amazing. So we have much to look forward to in the promise of eternal life, whether it be heaven or Christ coming back to establish the new earth and creation, where we will experience the full glory of the Lord And we and all of creation will be transformed to enjoy him forever. And heaven and and earth will be as one. What a fantastic thought. But that's not just for the future. It's joy and peace for today as well too.
Third, salvation is by God's grace and not anything we can do or earn. And this is liberating for me, and I hope that it's liberating for you. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 say this, for, grace you have, for, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. The second criminal again lived a life of violence and really did not confess Jesus until the very last moments of his life. But yet he was granted salvation. Salvation is a gift that none of us deserve or none of us can earn. It can only be given. And then last... As we look forward to eternal life that I mentioned a moment ago, specifically the new heaven and the new earth, the greatest part of it will be that Jesus is with us. So thirdly, as we look at what Christ is accomplishing, the last thing I want to point out is that he entrusts his spirit to God. So last is Jesus' final prayer. We know Jesus to be the true light as John says in his gospel. And we know that on the cross, he's veiled in darkness. And amid this darkness, in all the torture and all the horror that's going on around him, Jesus faces his death calmly. How can he be so calm in this moment after so much injustice, suffering, humiliation, and then also in bearing the weight of God's judgment? Well, he did what we should do in a moment of crisis. He remembered God's promises. Jesus most likely was thinking about what God said to him in Luke chapter 3 and verse 22, where God declares Jesus to be his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. And because God had declared that, because he had declared that, he can trust God to care for him. And of course, he has the knowledge and knows what God is doing in this moment as his full plan to unite all things. This is part of, again, of God's unfolding grace to redeem, restore, and unite all things. But even in his last words, he goes back to Scripture. He goes to Psalm 31.5, which is an expression of a deep and intimate trust of God the Father. In verse 46, he says this, Jesus, then calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, Into your hands I commit my spirit. That's from Psalm 31, verse 5. And having said this, he breathed his last. So instead of saving himself, Jesus in total trust freely gave his spirit over to the Father. He entrusted his spirit to God and completed God's plan to redeem, restore, and unite all things to himself. He completed the work of atoning for our sins and for defeating the curse of sin and death. And he did this for the glory of the Father and the good of his people. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we come before you in awe and wonder at the glorious works of your plan through Jesus Christ. Through his suffering and death on the cross as the ultimate expression of love and mercy so that we may be forgiven and that we may have eternal life and relationship with you. So, Father, we praise you and we thank you for your wonderful plan of salvation and for the work of Christ and his willingness to submit, to lay aside his crown of glory for this moment. And, Father, we look forward to that day when he will return again and fulfill and complete all things that have been done through his death on the cross. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.